Chapters 13 and 14 The Courtyard at Hope's Peak Academy's Eastern Quarter Deep at night The lights from the surrounding facilities were long gone. Only the street lamps, installed at fixed intervals, still dimly illuminated the darkness. In front of the clock tower on the edge of the courtyard stood a teenage girl, alone. She narrowed her eyes and looked at the clock above her head. He should be here soon, she whispered. The girl was waiting for someone. When she first contacted the man, he coldly refused to meet her, insisting that it wasn't necessary. But once she'd procured documents concerning shady deals in his past, she found him much more open to the suggestion. It wasn't hard, after all. She made her livelihood discovering people's secrets. In fact, she thought this one had given up a little too easily. What else was he hiding? Fame is a fickle food. You work so hard to get it, and all it gets you is your freedom lost. The man she was waiting for was a member of Hope's Peak Academy's steering committee. There was a reason she had to meet a member of the committee. There was something she had to ask directly, whatever the cost. There was a certain truth that the committee were earnestly trying to hide. A truth even her client, Hope's Peak Academy's headmaster, most likely did not know. The only avenue of investigation was to question a committee member directly. She had come to that important realization only a few short days after setting out on her investigation. Her formidable talent led her to it. Her name was Kyoko Kitigiri. She was a student in Hope's Peak Academy's 78th class and bore the title of Super High School Level Detective. And right now, she was employed by Hope's Peak's headmaster to investigate a certain incident. He sure is late, she whispered, looking up at the clock tower once more. Five minutes late. I should have asked him to be strictly on time. The wrinkles on her forehead deepened, but the moment she lowered her eyes from the clock, they disappeared. She saw a figure of a man in the distance. The figure glanced around, seemingly on guard, then proceeded slowly toward where she was standing. His features slowly became clearer. He was an elderly man wearing a pitch black suit and a matching pitch black necktie as if he was on the way back from a funeral. His grizzled hair was unnaturally stiff with pomade, and seemed almost artificial. As the man came closer, his face also revealed itself. His brow was covered with deep wrinkles that seemed to be chiseled directly into his skull. The sunken eyes below them glared at Kyoko with a disgusted expression. The distance between the two narrowed, and finally, when there were only three meters separating them, the man stopped. Was it you who called me here? The man opened his small, straight mouth and raised the question in a severe tone of voice. Was it you who wa- But his words were cut short. Something absurd, something completely out of place, came falling down from the sky. Both the man and his words were flattened by it. Kyoko felt as if the scene before her was a stop-motion animation as though she was witnessing a series of ridiculous tableaus. The school desk that came flying down from the sky hit the man directly on the head. The man's body twisted from the impact, and then collapsed. The desk struck the ground, and then bounced back into the air in recoil. At that point, another desk came flying down from above. It smashed into the fallen man's back, bending his body like a trampled ragdoll. Then, Yet another falling desk twisted his neck unnaturally. The man's face showed no sign of surprise. It was stuck in the same expression he had when he talked to Kyoko. Then, several more flying desks hit his body, making a huge cloud of dust as they hit the ground. An overdue intense crashing noise finally registered in Kyoko's ears. At the same time, a desk came shooting out from inside the cloud of dust, grazed her hair, and landed behind her revolving like a spinning top. It was a freakish development, a development with no rhyme or reason. The man who moments ago stood in front of Kyoko had been crushed by a large number of falling school desks as soon as he opened his mouth. It all took place in the span of a few seconds. It took Kyoko only a brief moment to regain her senses. The dust cloud was still rising in the air when she took off running up to the desk pile. 
There was already a deep red puddle next to the man, who was now buried under the rubble. Dark liquid seeped from his eyes, nose, and ears. Kyoko's mind quickly changed course. She turned her head to look above her. A vague silhouette stood atop the school building, slowly coming into focus. It was a human figure, illuminated by moonlight from behind. The figure brandished something above its head, and then threw it. It was a pipe chair, and it was flying down straight towards Kyoko. She jumped aside, dodging the chair's trajectory, and leaped into the school building. Yet another crashing noise came from behind her. She assumed a low posture as she ran through the building's corridors, and then continued to run up the stairs without stopping to catch her breath. At that moment, she didn't care at all that she had just been targeted. She was running purely for the sake of the clue, in an adrenaline rush that erased any sense of danger from her mind. Then, in no time at all, she reached the landing at the top floor and found the remains of a padlock lying on the floor in front of the door that led to the roof. This school should really consider buffing up security. She grabbed the doorknob, muttering cynically. The feeling of cold metal reached her fingertips. She squeezed the knob and pushed. The door opened easily and noiselessly. She immediately felt the strong cold night wind blowing past her body. She took a single cautious step into the doorway and quickly looked around the roof, dimly illuminated by starlight. There was no one there. She walked around the concrete floor, thoroughly checking the area near the door and every other place where a person could conceivably be hiding in the shadows. Nevertheless, she couldn't find anybody. I just missed them. A feeling of despondency assailed her, and she leaned her back on the iron fence surrounding the roof. Then, she looked up at the sky and quietly grumbled to herself. This is why I hate missing persons cases. Suddenly, a cold shiver ran past her back. Something wasn't right. She quickly turned over, pushed her body over the railing, and looked down into the courtyard. Her face caught the cold night wind, and her expression quickly turned grave serious. She could see the wreckage of school desks and pipe chairs near the clock tower, but there was something missing. The body that should have been there, wasn't. Kyoko's teeth chattered from the cold as she pulled her cell phone from an inner pocket. Just as she was about to push the call button, a hint of hesitation appeared on her face. Nevertheless, her finger soon pushed the button. After a couple of rings, she heard a man's voice. Are you free right now? Kyoko asked, skipping a greeting. There's something I want to report directly. I'm coming over. It was a few minutes after Kyoko Kitty Giddy had disappeared from the roof. Bzzz. A strange sound, as if the very air was being torn, echoed through the East Quarter's courtyard. Zap zap! Taser gun! exclaimed the high school girl, touting a pistol-shaped object high over her head. Her eyes were focused on the two guards lying in a pile on the floor, collapsed. They were both lying face down, and each had a small, thin needle sticking out of their back. A wire ran from each needle to the pistol in the girl's hand. Take that! She cried and pulled the trigger. Bzzz. The bodies of the two men, who were already unconscious, shook and spasmed along with the violent noise. Ha ha! An ecstatic expression appeared on the girl's face as she watched them. Junko and Ashima. She had no makeup on looked as if she had just woken up from sleep and kept yawning big yawns. The pistol she held in her hand was a taser gun, a powerful self-defense weapon. It was a type of stun gun. By shooting some target with a needle connected to a wire, she could send an electric current through the target's body. It wasn't originally strong enough to kill a person, but since she'd modified it to send a stronger current, it wouldn't be so strange if someone did die. A despair-inducing self-defense weapon. One might say it made her unbeatable. Junko and Ashima continued playing with the taser gun for a short while, but soon grew tired of it. She pulled the wires away with her bare hands and threw them into a plastic bag. Then, she nonchalantly dumped the bag into a nearby trash can. Well then, I think that took care of every annoying person in my way. It seems that little Miss Kendaichi also disappeared to who knows where. <laughs> Does that mean I have the place all to myself? She let out a theatrical sigh of relief and walked majestically across the plaza. Her destination was the clock tower, 
She didn't attempt to hide herself at all. Quite the opposite. She exhibited a sense of presence that seemed to scream at people to look at her. It also had the sinister suggestion that by doing so they might end up dead. That said, I never expected little Miss Conan to stick her nose into my business. It must be that pesky headmaster's meddling. But my plans for this scenario don't include her at all, so what am I to do? I mean, it is interesting to have her around, but it's also possible she'll be a real hindrance after I went through all that effort of- Hey, wait, 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 wait? She stopped abruptly, as if about to trip forward, and stared at the wreckage of the school desks and pipe chairs in front of her. The moment she saw it, the cruel smile that was plastered on her face disappeared. The body isn't here, she spat out. Again? This sure is despair-inducing, as despair-inducing as all your dreams crumbling down. Nevertheless, there was a smile on her face. Smiling, she kicked the pipe chair that was lying on the ground near her feet. It didn't seem like a very powerful kick, but the chair flew a few meters, hit a street lamp that was in its way, and shot off into the air like a ping-pong ball. Then, when the sound of the clash's echo disappeared from the plaza, Junko Inoshima's figure was already gone vanished like a shadow.